Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to a new session of Graviticulas. Today's speaker is Leon Friadri. Leon completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand around 2016. Then he obtained his PhD from the University of Melbourne, Australia in 2021 under the supervision of Raymond Volkes, Nicole Bell and Matthew Donan. From May of this year, Leon holds a postdoctoral position at the University of Massachusetts, Hemert. So I would like to invite Leon now to tell us all about testing electroweak pathogenesis at colliders. So Leon, the screen is yeah. all yours. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, um, I'm not going to be talking about these two papers on pathogenesis and collider phenomenology that was done during my PhD um, with my supervisors and also Michael Ramsey myself and also maybe touching on one of the more recent papers that was also done in collaboration with Thomas Tenkanen and Viku Tran. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start with providing just a very general overview of electric pharyngesis before going on to talk about some of the specific models that I was working on. Um, just one that actually like, you know, features full Fully, a full realization of barogenesis that can generate the observed fairness symmetry, and then some other models that are inspired by novel electric phase transitions. Um, so to start off with, um, as I hope you're all aware, the, the universe has a baryon asymmetry. And what that means is that we see more matter than antimatter in the universe. And this is usually characterized using the so-called uh, baryon to entropy ratio, this uh, NB on S. And it's kind of a relatively small asymmetry, but it's significant because it's, you know, the reason why we have stars and galaxies today. And the standard model has no mechanism for explaining the origin of this asymmetry for like dynamically generating it. So if you want to explain where this asymmetry came from, you need some beyond the standard model of physics. Um, so in general, any mechanism that you want to use to try explain the origin of the Baryon asymmetry needs to satisfy the so-called um, three Sakharov conditions. And firstly, and kind of very intuitively, if you want to violate and you know, generate Baryon asymmetry, you need some process that violates Baryon number. Um, Otherwise, you can't generate an aberrant asymmetry. Um, secondly, this process has to occur out of equilibrium. And this basically means that the, um, uh, the, the kind of like process that generates this asymmetry and the process that destroys this asymmetry aren't happening at the same rate so that you generate an asymmetry. And finally, this process needs to involve some C and CP violation, which um, you can kind of understand as telling you that there's some reason why generating baryons is favored over a process that generates anti-baryons. And as long as you can satisfy all these three conditions with some process, in principle, you can use this to generate a net baryon asymmetry. So fortunately for us, the first of these three conditions is already satisfied in the standard model via electroweak spalerons. So just, I'm gonna very briefly discuss them, but um, Basically, the standard model uh, enormously violates Baryon and Lepton number, even though they're kind of classically conserved. Um, and electric sphalons are not put over the processes that allow these uh, Baryon and Lepton numbers to be violated. However, the rate of sphalerons is um, exponentially suppressed by the electroweak symmetry breaking Higgs vacuum expectation value. In particular, it's like an exponential suppression where. Um, effectively the surveillance rate that you see at zero temperature today is effectively zero, but in principle at very, very high temperatures or when the Higgs VEV becomes just small when you have, um, when you restore the electric symmetry, these surveillance can violate baryon number and you can use these to generate a net baryon asymmetry. Um, and in particular, electric baryogenesis, which is baryogenesis during the electric phase condition is one set one mechanism that can satisfy all three of these conditions. So again, the baryon number violation comes from sphalerons, the out of equilibrium conditions comes from the electric phase transition, while the charge and charge parity violation can come from interactions with the standard model Higgs or some other scalar charged under SU2. Um, so just to briefly touch on the electric phase transition. So if you're familiar with the, you know, in standard model, there's the Higgs mechanism where you have this potential where at the origin, you don't have a local minimum, so you have like some unstable point, and the Higgs VEV is basically the, the potential is minimized when the Higgs gains a VEV away from the origin, and this then spontaneously breaks electric symmetry. Um, however, instead of having to minimize, you know, the normal potential you put into the Lagrangian, 
what you actually need to do is you need to minimize the so-called effective potential. In particular, you have this potential that effectively includes loop contributions that depend on all the you know, particles and couplings in your model. And at very high temperatures and densities, these, um, this potential will pick up some temperature dependence. And this then means that as the temperature changes, this potential will evolve. And in principle, the bottom left here, where on the x-axis, we have some phi, some uh, vacuum expectation value of some particle. And on the y-axis, we have the uh, effective potential at that, that value. Um, and I kind of like sketched three different potentials here, which and blue is cold, like low temperatures. Um, and one kind of way that this potential could evolve is that uh, the minimum, which starts off at zero, can just kind of like smoothly move away from zero. And we have a vacuum expectation value. Um, so you still have a phase condition, but it's kind of like a smooth phase condition where the VEV just smoothly goes away from zero. Um, but there's also another kind of phase condition called a first order phase condition, which is sketched on this plot on the, the right here, where instead of like smoothly moving away from the origin, you have a scenario where the minimum kind of starts to develop, where the potential starts to develop a second minimum, um, which then eventually becomes the true global minimum, but is separated from the original. Gaining of that. tunneling where you basically have a regional space that will spontaneously tunnel to this new minimum um, and then start expanding outwards. So you basically have bubbles nucleating in a new universe. Um, and this is a first of phase condition and this is what we need for electric baryogenesis because if you have kind of like this universe where you know everywhere the vacuum expectation value of your scalar is zero and you start nucleating these bubbles where the vacuum expectation value is non-zero the expansion of these bubbles is what provides us our out of equilibrium dynamics that is the, you know, the second Sakharov condition. And if you then kind of like zoom in on this bubble wall as it's expanding outwards, if you have some sort of CP violating interactions that occur with this bubble wall, then as this bubble wall kind of like sweeps through the plasma from left to right, in principle, you could have, you know, initially you'll have some, you know, equal number densities of like left-handed particles, and antiparticles, but then these CP writing interactions can basically set up an asymmetry around the bubble. Okay, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, so um, in general, you need to set up this asymmetry around the bubble wall, and you do that by uh, setting up a set of quantum transport equations and then solving for all of the number density around the wall. And you typically end up with this sort of a plot here, where on the um, x axis, or I guess the z axis, um, this parameterizes the distance in front of or behind the bubble wall, where positive z values are inside of the bubble and negative z values are outside of the bubble. And on the y-axis is just the number density of some particle species. And you'll generally get the sort of like asymmetry where at the origin, you have some cp bonding contractions that kind of provide a source term. And then you have your number densities diffusing in front of it and inside of the bubble wall. And what you want is to solve for the net number density of left-handed particles, um, which then you use to derive the final bearing asymmetry. And note that the, the number densities can be negative here because this is uh, plotting the number of particles minus the number of antiparticles. So negative values, um, yeah, just mean that there's more of one than the other. Um, and throughout my work, we use something called the VEV insertion approximation to actually derive these transport equations. 
So in general, for the web insertion approximation, the way you derive these transport rates is by evaluating these kind of self-energy diagrams, where when you expand these self-energy diagrams, you find that these sort of like loop contributions um, give you chemical uh, kind of like reaction rates that drive your species towards chemical equilibrium, where, um, and then you also get these other diagrams that have these VEV insertions where you have some spatially varying VEVs, where if these couplings here, these Yukawa couplings involve some CP violation, these spatially varying VEV terms will give you some source term that is non-zero at the bubble wall, and also some other rates that also help drive particles towards equilibrium. And then you basically need to solve all of the, uh, evaluate all of these diagrams to so get all of these rates and set up a set of differential equations. And then you solve them and then you get the final bearing asymmetry. So that's a general overview of baryogenesis. So why doesn't it work in the standard model? Um, well, some of them, some of the cycle conditions are satisfied, like we do have electric spherons, but unfortunately, while we have a electric phase transition, the phase transition isn't a first order phase transition, it's a crossover phase transition. Um, and also, even if it were a first order phase transition, the amount of charge and charge parity violation present in the standard model um, isn't sufficiently large to explain the observed asymmetry. Um, so you need some beyond the standard model physics. Um, now, in general, in order to get successful electric pyrogenesis, this means that you need to introduce new particles that are coupled to the standard model Higgs or just the weak gauge boson, so like additional scalars charged under SU2. Um, because then you need these in order to generate the a first order phase transition. Secondly, you need new charge parity violating interactions with the Selmer Higgs or these new scalars that you introduce. And finally, any new particles that you introduce to try generate successful electric pyrogenesis um, needs to have masses that can't be much larger than the electric weak scale. And this is simply because in order for them to be present in the early universe during the phase transition, if their masses were much larger than the electric scale, then they would be suppressed and like, you know, Boltzmann suppression. So in general, this means that electric baryogenesis are going to be very testable at colliders and just other like uh, precision experiments because necessarily because of the couplings and the mass scales, your particles are going to be producible at current colliders. And then you have precision tests like um, searches for charge parity violation by looking at electric dipole moments. Um, which strongly constrain additional CP violation. And finally, um, I mean, you might have novel signatures from first order phase transition by looking at things like the gravitation, by looking for the stochastic gravitational wave background that such phase transitions would generate. Okay, so that was a very general overview of baryogenesis. And I'm now going to start talking about some specific models. So, firstly, there's a model featuring singlets and vector like leptons. Um, so in particular, we're going to be looking at a model where you introduce two new real gauge singlet scalars um, that couple the same model Higgs and generate a, a first order phase transition. Um, and we're also going to introduce an additional vector-like lepton doublet that transforms in the same way as the standard model left-handed lepton doublets. Um, and these are then also going to couple with the standard model Higgs, these new scalars, and also the standard model vector like lepton, uh, standard model lepton doublets. Um, however, we're going to restrict ourselves to only considering scenarios where the vector like leptons couple to the third generation standard model leptons. In general, you can consider more general couplings, but they're going to be strongly constrained by lepton universality. So this is currently just a simplifying assumption to restrict the number of parameters that we have to scan over. Um, so this kind of scenario we're interested in is a one where the singlets enable this the first order phase transition, but the phase transition sort of proceeds in two steps where if you look at this plot here, you start off at very high temperatures at the sort of like origin, and then along the x-axis, this sort of represents the BSM scalars gaining a non-zero VEV. Um, and this could be a first order or second order phase transition. And then at some lower temperature, you have a second phase transition, which takes you from this, you know, um, new minimum towards the standard model like minimum where just the standard model Higgs has a VEV. And it's during the second step that you actually break electric symmetry because the scalars are, you know, aren't charged on the SU2. Um, and during the second step, you, um, we actually generate the bearing asymmetry. And in particular, um, 
the reason we have two new singlet scalars is because during the second step, uh, these singlet scalars will also have a uh, uh, changing vacuum expectation values, which means that um, their Yukawa couplings with these new standard model and vector-like leptons, um, if you have some CPU writing interactions here, these sort of like web insertion diagrams are what gives rise to uh, the CPU writing source terms that we need for baryogenesis. Um, particularly these like new couplings here are, are going to kind of the main couplings responsible for generating a net baryon asymmetry. Um, so in general, this part of the content actually introduces a lot of new parameters, both the masses, the a bunch of new Yukawa couplings and all of the new scalar couplings. Um, and in general, evaluating the phase transition history and also looking at you know collider phenology is very computationally intensive. So in order to actually when we're actually looking at this model, we proceeded by taking some benchmark points because doing a complete scan of the parameter space isn't really feasible. Um, so in order to do that, we first perform a scan over the only the scalar potential parameter space to look for a set of scalar potential parameters that give you the kind of phase transition that we're looking for. Um, in order to do that, we use this uh, package called Cosmo Transitions to evaluate the phase transition history. Um, and then, yeah, perform a random scan until we find the right kind of phase transition. So for example, um, we chose four benchmark points, which I, I, we just denote A, B, C, and D. Um, and for example, for benchmark A, you get this kind of a phase transition here, where um, this plot is showing here on the left as a on the x-axis is the temperature. Um, so the zero temperature is the universe at zero temperature today, and um, far to the right is the early universe at very high temperatures. Oh, sorry. And on the y-axis, it's kind of showing the location of the VEV that minimizes this potential just in terms of the uh, absolute distance from the origin. And what you have is you have these two phases. One is just this blue line um, where initially no particles has a VEV and you just had zero. And then as the universe cools, there's a second order phase transition where the scalar singlets gain a non-zero VEV. Um, before you have this other minimum, this green line appearing, which is a minimum where the Higgs gains a VEV. And at some point, this becomes the true global minimum. And at a temperature just below 100 GeV, you have a first order phase transition where you tunnel from one minimum to the other. And it's during this kind of phase transition where we have the kind of transition we want, whether the Higgs is breaking electric symmetry while the single scalars have changing valves. And you end up nucleating these sort of bubbles, which is which are shown on the right here. Where again, um, here on the x-axis, uh, it's show, just showing the um, it's the radial coordinate. So these are spherically symmetric bubbles. So R equals zero is the inside of the bubble and very large R is far side of the bubble. And on the y-axis, it's showing the actual like um, VEV profiles as a function of the radius. And so you start nucleating these bubbles where inside of the bubble, the this blue line, the, the Higgs VEV is non-zero while far, far outside of the bubble, the Higgs VEV is zero and you have some non-zero um, scalar VEVs. So this is kind of the, the bubbles you nucleate during this phase transition. Um, so these are the kind of phase transitions we're looking for. And we choose four benchmark points that give you this kind of phase transitions. In particular, benchmarks A and B have the same scalar potential parameters, but different Yukawa couplings. And um, as a result, also some different collider phenomenology. Meanwhile, benchmarks C and D similarly have kind of a very similar scalar potential, except they differ slightly in that the, in one case for benchmark C, the singlet scalars can mix with the standard model Higgs, while for benchmark D, there is no mixing between the scalars. So you basically have some Z2 symmetries. Um, and after evaluating all of the relevant, you know, web insertion diagrams to derive the transport rates and um, then plugging them into your differential equation and solving them, you can get the final bearing asymmetry. Um, in particular, we find that for these kind of benchmark points, you can readily generate the required bearing asymmetry. So for example, if you have a vector-like lepton with a mass of about 500 GeV, um, for each of the you know, four benchmark points we choose, you can generate the right bearing asymmetry, which is you know, on the order of 10 to the minus 10. And you know, on the plot on the bottom right here, it's just showing as a function of the two Yukawa clubbings that I mentioned before, the, the ones that are the Yukawa clubbings between the, the new single scalars and the vector-like leptons and the standard model leptons, which are the couplings that are critical for generating the right bearing asymmetry. Um, we have these two Yukawa couplings on the x and the y-axis, and the uh, um, 
plot is just a contour plot showing the final bearing symmetry you get for the specific set of benchmark points, benchmark parameters. Um, and you can easily, you know, generate, you know, an order of magnitude larger asymmetry than you need to if you allow the couplings to be as large as, you know, like one basically. Um, but even just, you know, for values of like 0.1 or a hundredth, you can more or less generate the right bearing asymmetry. Um, so it's kind of like the baryogenesis part of my talk. The rest is going to be more about uh, collider phenology. Um, so as I mentioned before, any baryogenesis models are necessarily going to be tested by colliders. And in our case, we have these new SU2 um, lepton doublets. And what this means that they're going to be necessarily producible at colliders just via electric processes. So these like charged and neutral current Drellian processes are going to pair produce our new vector-like leptons. Um, and in contrast, the singlet scalars production cross section is generally very small because you tend to produce them, you know, as a result of, you know, processes where you have some intermediate Higgs. They generally get produced, uh, yeah, as a result of their coupling to the standard model Higgs. Um, however, they're still going to be relevant for the cloud technology because they all generally appear in the decay chain for these vector-like leptons. Um, so in general, if you look at something like a minimal vector-like lepton model, you find that the vector-like leptons will always decay via their um, mixing with the standard model leptons that's induced via their coupling with the standard model Higgs. Um, and in general, then you'll find that like the heavy like charged leptons will decay into like a Z or Higgs and your some like third generation standard model leptons, so the, the tau, um, or the neutral one will decay into W and also a tau. Um, however, now that we have these uh, scalar singlets, in the case where the singlets are less massive than the vector-like leptons, these vector-like leptons will instead decay with these singlet scalars in their decay chains. Um, and these singlet scalars, if they mix with the standard model Higgs, will then inherit decays that are similar to kind of like a light Higgs boson. Um, so you generally have, you know, you'll pair produce these uh, vector-like leptons and they'll decay into like a tau and an S, where the S will then decay into like either a fermion pair or you know, W, W star, something like that. Um, and in general, these sorts of decay chains will then result in, you know, um, signatures of colliders where you have, you know, if you pair producing these effect like leptons and each of them can produce multiple taus, for example, you'll end up with uh, events that feature many tau leptons. And there's existing Atlas and CMS searches that look for your know, multi-lepton signatures. Um, so in order to like look at the constraints on our model, we use MadGraph Pythia Delphi is kind of the standard collider tools to generate Monte Carlo events. And then we use um, Checkmate, another like collider uh, analysis tool to um, uh, examine the constraints. And basically Checkmate, what it does is it implements existing Atlas and CMS searches. So it applies the same you know, cuts that they apply to their Monte Carlo events to your Monte Carlo events, and then compares your expected number of events to the reported you know, observed number of events. Um, and in particular for our case, um, like I mentioned before, there's existing Atlas and TMS searches in particular ones that look for, you know, Chargenos and Neutralinos. So like see these SUSI searches, which have the same kind of signal region. Um, and at the time that this paper was written during my PhD, um, this only included searches with uh, 36 inverse center bounds of data. There's now newer searches up to uh, 139 inverse center bounds of data. Um, so the results here are going to be slightly out of date. Um, but yeah. So basically what you get is after you know, using Checkmate to uh, apply the cuts, it spits out this, this R value, this ratio that basically gives you the, it's a ratio of the, up, the lower bound on the number of events predicted by your model divided by the upper bound on the number of observed events. So kind of like a, conservative estimate where if this ratio is bigger than one, um, your model is excluded at basically 95% confidence. Um, and this plot here is showing the this R value, this ratio as a function of the mass of the vector like leptons, where any value bigger than one is excluded basically. And these four colored lines are the four benchmark points I was talking about before, where um, for you know benchmark points A and B, the the, the basically the lower bound on the mass can be as low as like 300 GV all the way up to like, you know, 500 GV. And for benchmark point D, 
the constraints are really bad, like it's on the order of um, 900 GV, where I mentioned before, the difference between benchmark D and all the other benchmarks is in benchmark D, you don't have mixing between the standard model pigs and the new scalar singlets, which then means that the decay chains um, involve many more leptons. And again, it's, it, you get lots of signal events. So this is why benchmark D is kind of very strongly excluded. So again, it goes without saying that we just chose four benchmark points. This is by no means a complete scan of the parameter space. But the key takeaway is that um, for the baryogenesis scenario we were looking at before, we chose set the mass of the vector like leptons to be 500 GeV. And we find that for some of the benchmarks, the benchmark A, the mass can be as the, the lower bound of the mass can be as low as 300 GeV. So there's sufficient kind of like room to explain the origin of the baryonic symmetry um, while still satisfying collider constraints. Um, yeah, so that's collider phenology, and I'm not going to briefly talk about things like uh, some of the other tests for baryogenesis, in particular, um, electron electric dipole moments. So I mentioned before that um, any new source of CP violation will lead to non zero EDMs, and the standard model, which has some CP violation, predicts very small EDMs on the order of like 10 to the minus 38 electron centimeters. Um, and currently, we there are some experiments that try to look for these EDMs, particularly the ACME experiment. Um, and they currently place constraints on the EDMs that are much weaker than the value predicted by the standard model, like you know only probing down to ten to the minus twenty nine electron centimeters. Um, but in general, if you have some new CPU violation, you can look at these kind of like uh, these just like kind of vertex corrections featuring loop diagrams with the new particle content. And if you generate this kind of effective operator, this coefficient out front will be your EDM and you'll generate new contributions to the EDM. And in particular for our particle content, we get these two loop bar Z style diagrams, which are you know, shown in this Feynman diagram here, where you basically have your new vector like leptons in this loop here. And you have these CP violating uh, Yukawa couplings that generate in that, 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 that are required to generate an adbearing asymmetry, but will also then necessarily generate contributions to the EDM like this. Um, uh, however, in our case, fortunately, all of the um, EDMs are lying below current EDM constraints. So this table here is showing the like uh, EDM as a for the three of the benchmark parameters, um, and uh, you know somewhere between. Uh, two orders of magnitude below the current constraints on the case of benchmark C, um, sitting on the edge of being excluded. And benchmark point D isn't excluded here because I mentioned before, benchmark point D doesn't have scalar mixing. Um, and this two loop diagram necessarily relies on mixing between the um, uh, singlets and the standard model Higgs, which means that in order to evaluate the EDM for benchmark point D, you'd need to go to three loop diagrams, which we didn't do. But benchmark D already has issues where, you know, without scalar mixing, you have very strong LHC constraints. So, yeah, it's sort of already excluded. Um, so, in summary, kind of this is kind of a very simplistic model, which can both generate the observed barrier asymmetry and um, avoid current EDM and collider constraints. Um, but it, you know, it's a very nice model because it features a lot of the kind of like standard phenology considerations you need to think about when you're looking at baryogenesis models. Um, um, yeah, and in general, while the model um, we use only thirty of data, um, if you include analyses with uh, one hundred and thirty nine inverse front amount of data, this model might be excluded at this point. Um, but it's still a very appealing model because it's very simple and uh, forms a good toy model for looking at things like the uh, transport equations and how you actually go about solving the bearing asymmetry around the bubble wall. Um, yeah. So that was one of the models I'm going to talk about. I'm also going to spend some time talking about a minimal triplet extension to the standard model. And Unlike the previous model, this model is not going to be capable of generating the observed bearing asymmetry, but it's just um, inspired by models that look at novel look look at novel electric phase transitions. So um, we're going to consider the standard model just extended with a real SU two triplet scalar, and in particular, we're interested in this kind of like uh, the regional parameter space where you get a two step electric symmetry breaking phase transition. So this is indicated in this plot here, 
where again, a sort of at very high temperature, you start off at the origin. Um, and then as the universe cools, you have one phase transition where this new, new triplet scalar, the sigma, gains a valve, uh, which breaks electric symmetry. Um, and then later on, you have a second phase transition, which takes you to the standard model Higgs-like minimum, where just the standard model Higgs has a VEV. And in this case, um, if you want to successfully baryogenesis, in principle, the baryogenesis has to happen during this first transition because this transition breaks electric symmetry. So a full model that you know generates a baryon asymmetry in this model and these CP virus interactions that involve this new triplet scalar instead of the standard model Higgs, which is why these sort of models with novel electric symmetry breaking phase transitions are interesting because it means that the CP valid interactions that you need to generate the asymmetry are sort of like secluded somewhat from the standard model um, because they feature this new scalar instead of the standard model Higgs. Um, so this is kind of like the a sketch of the some of the terms that appear in this uh, in the scalar potential um, when you include this new triplet. In particular, you have this kind of like quadratic term, and in general, in order for a scalar to uh, gain a non-zero vacuum expectation value in the early universe, this quadratic term needs to be negative, which because of the choice of the sign up front here means that this mu sigma square term needs to be positive. Um, and, you know, this is sort of like the same rationale as you just see in like the standard model Higgs potential. You have this like negative quadratic term. Um, meanwhile, um, this like uh, portal coupling between the triplet and the standard model Higgs is what's going to be responsible for generating a, a, a positive contribution to the kind of like overall mass term for the triplet, where the final mass of the triplet is going to be the sum of this quadratic term and this quadratic coupling times the Higgs valve. But this means necessarily means that if you want your triplet to have a large mass, you necessarily need to have a very large kind of portal interaction. Um, because again, we, we want this quadratic term to basically be negative. Um, but if you then also impose restrictions like you know tree level vacuum stability, perturbativity, and perturbative unitarity, um, this will give you an upper bound on the size of this quartic coupling at this upper bound on the coupling then gives you an upper bound on the mass of the triplet. So as an example, if you want um, the, if you just set the quadratic term equal to zero, um, reasonable constraints imposed on this quarter coupling basically tell you that the mass of the triplet needs to be less than about 400 GeV. So again, this is sort of, in general, for a particle to be relevant during the electric phase transition, you necessarily have an upper bound on the mass, and this is all sort of like quantifying what that upper bound is. So in principle, if you, you do collider searches for the triplet and you find that the constraint of the mass is bigger than that, um, the sort of like novel phase transition would be ruled out. Um, and finally, there's this other like term at the potential, this like um, orange term here, this cubic term. Um, now, in general, if this is non-zero, then when the Higgs gains its VEV, this basically gives you like a term linear in sigma, which induces the triplet to gain a non-zero VEV. Um, but from electric precision measurements, you we know that the VEV of a triplet scalar or a real triplet scalar um, has to be very small, it has to be like less than about three GeV, which means that this term can't be very big, but in general, it can give you give you a small induced VEV, which results in mixing between the standard model Higgs and this new triplet scalar. Um, um, yeah. So if you have this cubic term, this will then induce mix mixing, which then allows your new scalars to decay. So in general, you'll find these, this um, new neut neutral scalar, which most is mostly composed of the neutral component of the triplet, but also partly from the standard model Higgs neutral component, and also these two new charge scalars. And they'll you know, now be able to decay via this mixing. So for very like low masses on the masses on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we're showing um, the branching ratio for various decay channels. So for very low masses, the neutral scalar will decay, so like the standard model Higgs, into like pairs of fermions or maybe gluons. While for very large masses, it will generally decay into pairs of weak H bosons. And similarly, um, the charge scalars will decay in a way that's similar to like the charge scalars you encounter in two X doublet models. But again, for low masses, it's pairs of fermions, and for large masses, it's generally um, weak H bosons or maybe like uh, top quarks and bottom quarks. And as before, we have these new scalars that are charged on SE2, 
which means that they're necessarily producible at colliders via um, electric processes. So these Drell-Yan processes will produce pairs of scalars. And also, again, if the portal interaction is very big, which it needs to be if we want the quadrilateral to be negative and we want the mass of the triplet to be sizable, then you can also pr produce an appreciable number of scalars via um, uh, kind of like an intermediate Higgs produced via something like gluon gluon fusion. Um, but in general, and you can also like produce single scalars, but um, the production cross section for producing a single scalar um, is suppressed by the mixing angle, which has to be small because the VEV of the triplet has to be small. So in general, primarily produce them in pairs. Um, but then again, you have a similar scenario to the one you had with the uh, vector electrons and singlets, where you pair producing these new scalars and they generally decay into pairs of fermions or pairs of weak H bosons, which then um, can give rise to uh, signal events where you have many, many leptons. Um, so again, you'll have these Atlas and CMS searches looking for Chardinos and neutrinos and other SUSY models um, that will basically place constraints on your model. So again, we perform the same kind of like analysis where we use um, Madgraf, Pythia, and Delphi's to generate Monte Carlo events. And then we use Checkmate to analyze the Monte Carlo events and place constraints on our model. Um, and the results are shown in this kind of contour plot here, where on the x-axis is the mass of a new neutral scalar, so the basically the mass of the triplet. And on the y-axis is this um, quadratic term I was talking about before, where again, we're sort of interested in the regional parameter space where the quadratic term is negative, which means mu sigma squared is positive. Um, and the colors indicate the confidence limit to, with which you can exclude this regional parameter space, um, where any value less than uh, 0. 05 is considered ex is excluded at 95% confidence. Um, and you can see from this that basically any regional front space where the mass of the triplet is less than about 230 GeV is excluded at 95% confidence, except for some small regions where there's um, due to some cancellation in some of the mixing angles, uh, the branching ratios mean that um, you get less signal events and it's not quite excluded. But again, this is um, using only 36 inverse of data and using the, the new analyses with additional data, you know, this point is probably excluded. And um, I should mention this, the, this gray region up here is the region where the, your couplings become non-perturbative. So I mentioned before that the problem is if you want this quadratic term to be very negative, you need very large couplings. And as you make it this large, you enter like the non-perturbative region of the parameter space. Um, yeah. So, that's the scenario you get when you allow this triplet to decay, um, when you have, sorry, when you allow this triplet to mix with the standard model Higgs, which then allows it to decay. Um, however, there's also another scenario you should look at, which is one where this uh, cubic term is zero, which then also implies that the VEV of the triplet is zero because you're not like inducing a VEV. Um, and then this leaves you with a Lagrangian where you have a Z2 symmetry, which is invariant under, you know, sigma goes to minus sigma. Um, and this means that in general, your triplet will be stable. However, um, there's actually still going to be a small radiative mass splitting. That means that the charge components of the triplet are slightly more massive than the neutral component of the triplet, um, which means that in reality, the charge triplet can decay into the neutral triplet and a low energy pion, while the neutral triplet is stable and in principle um, will contribute to the dark matter relic density. Um, which means you will then instead get constraints from dark matter direct detection and indirect detection searches, and just, you know, again, dark matter searches at the LHC. Um, so if you look at something like this, you've, it turns out that dark matter direct detection places severe constraints on the parameter space we're interested in. So um, there's these two plots here where the plot on the left, again, it is showing on the, y, on the x axis, it's the mass of the triplet, and on the y axis, it's the quadratic term. Again, we're interested in this region where the quadratic term is negative, which means mu sigma squared is positive. So this region here, um, and the gray regions indicate regions where your couplings, you have non-perturbative couplings between the standard model and the uh, standard model Higgs and the triplet. And um, this green region is the regional parameter space that satisfies dark matter direct detection constraints. Um, 
and you can see it just on the plot on the left here, this region lies completely outside of the region where the mu sigma square is positive. Um, and the plot on the right hand side here is, is basically showing the same thing and the same region of parameter space, but instead of plotting the quadratic term on the y axis, we're plotting the, um, the portal coupling on the y axis. And you can see that the kind of region where you can avoid direct detection constraints is the region where this quarter coupling is around zero, which again, the, if you follow the reasoning from before, we need this part coupling to be big if we want mu sigma squared, yeah, to be positive. So just this alone basically rules out, um, if, if, if you allow the triplet to be stable with the Z2 symmetry, this completely rules out the possibility of having this novel electric phase transition. Um, and finally, it's also worth mentioning that um, there's so collider searches that also place constraints. So I mentioned before that in the the because of this um, radiative mass splitting, the charge component of the triplet can in general decay into the neutral triplet and the low energy pion, um, and this proceeds. This will then give rise to um, disappearing charge tracts at colliders. So in general, so this plot here is just kind of like a sketch of uh, some interactions happening inside of your the detector, like at the at Atlas, um, where you have some interactions happening at the center of the detector, you produce this a new charge particle, in this case, a charge geno, um, and it travels through the detector. And then at some point, halfway through the detector, it decays into this massive neutral particle, which takes away most of the energy and a very low energy pion, which even if it hits, part of, hits parts of the detector, because it has so low energy, you basically don't pick it up. So what you get is this disappearing charge track that disappears halfway through your detector. And you'll also get, generate the same kind of um, uh, disappearing charge tracks in our model with, with the triplets. Um, so in general, these also place severe constraints on the triplets, um, which require basically the mass of the neutral component to be larger than about 300 GeV. Um, but it's still important because, in principle, if you'd allow this cubic term to be non-zero but very, very small, such that the neutral triplet still mixes with the standard model Higgs and can decay and avoid dark matter constraints, um, then you still need to use these kind of searches to place constraints on the model because in this regional of space, um, you wouldn't be sensitive to the normal um, searches I was talking about before with the multiple leptons and you also wouldn't you know be able to use dark matter direct detection constraints um, so you need to use the kind of like displaced vertex or disappearing charge track searches to look for the triplet um, and there may be some reason of parameter space where the the lower bound on the mass may be less than 300 GV this is sort of kind of like the best case scenario for uh, ruling out the triplet um and then finally, I should mention there's also like other things you can use to try to place constraints on the triplet. So uh, in general, any new charge scalars that couple with the standard model Higgs will generate a contribution to the Higgs diphoton rate. Um, just so the, the standard model Higgs can decay into pairs of photons, and it does so via these kind of like loop diagrams involving usually Ws or top quarks. But um, if you have new scalars, these will modify the diphoton rate. So by making precise measurements of this rate, you can place constraints on the masses and couplings from uh, for these new particles. Um, and this plot here is again showing on the x-axis the mass of the triplet, on the y-axis the quadratic term, and the contour region, uh, the contours are showing the um, variations from the experimentally measured diphoton rate, where, sorry, the value of one is the um, the region where the default rate exactly agrees with the standard model prediction and the sorry the, the the solid black line is the currently experimentally measured default rate which is actually slightly above the standard model default rate um and then the dashed lines are the one and one two and three sigma contours from this currently measured value and again the region of parameter space which is, uh, is this kind of like region up here um and most of it is at like, you know, two sigma. So in principle, if you improve the accuracy of the diphoton rate measurements, you can also exclude this regional parameter space entirely. Um, so maybe with the high Lumi LHC, um, you might be able to, you know, rule out again, this regional parameter space altogether. Um, and then finally, something I said 
mentioned before, is uh, one other way you could try to probe these kind of like novel electric phase transitions is by looking for the stochastic gravitational wave background that these uh, phase transitions will in general produce. So in the early universe, if you have a first of a phase transition, I mentioned before that happens via the nucleation of these bubbles. And as these bubbles expand, they interact with the plasma and will accelerate the plasma in front of them. And then eventually these bubbles will start sort of colliding with each other. And um, this process uh, can lead to like kind of turbulent flow in the plasma and a bunch of other mechanisms that can generate this kind of stochastic gravitational wave background. And there's some prospect for eventually measuring this background using future space-based gravitational wave detectors. Um, and in general, the kind of like magnitude of the gravitational wave signal that you'd get from like a basic first order phase transition isn't strong enough to be detected by things like LISA, um, like the, I guess, first generation space-based detectors. But if you look at these kind of like two-step phase transitions where you can have potentially significant supercooling, um, you can generate a strong enough gravitational wave signal that you might be able to detect it. So um, this, these plots here are showing, um, so this plot on the bottom left here is showing as a function of the triplet mass on the x-axis and on the y-axis, this triplet Higgs portal coupling. Um, and the colors indicate um, regions of parameter space that give you different set of phase transitions. So the light blue is a crossover phase transition. Uh, green is a first order phase transition where you directly go to the Stanmore Higgs phase. This red region is a two-step phase transition, which is the one I've been talking about and have been interested in where the triplet gains a VEV before a subsequent transition takes you to the Senawana Higgs phase. And finally, there's this gray region, which now is a metastable region where basically um, you never end up in the standard model Higgs minimum. Um, so if you look at kind of like the parameter space here, um, you can try evaluate the resulting gravitational wave power spectrum to probe the you know, uh, prospects of measuring it um, via these space-based gravitational wave detectors. And the, the kind of resulting gravitational wave signature you get is kind of shown on this plot on the right here, where on the X and Y axis, we show uh, these are two parameters that are used to characterize the electric phase transition. So the Y axis is this beta on H, which basically tells you about the rate at which the electric phase transition completes, while the um, alpha, the parameter on the X axis, basically tells you about the strength of the phase transition. And it, these contours here, um, for example, this LISA contour here, is the regional parameter space that LISA could potentially probe. And then you have these other regions like ELISA and the, the CIGO, um, and these are kind of like the regional parameter space that they could probe. And if you look at the phase transition um, that you get in this regional parameter space, like this like the blue line here, um, as you move, you know, as you increase this quarter coupling, you move from the kind of a first order phase transition region through to the two-step phase transition region up until you get to like this metastable region where the phase transition never occurs and you never nucleate bubbles. And the way this looks like on the kind of like the, uh, the plot on the right here is you kind of like follow these contours down here and you find that some region of the parameter space could potentially be lie within this uh, region of parameter space that Lisa could detect. And this is particularly interesting because while you can use things like collider searches to place constraints on the masses of the triplet, in general, measuring scalar couplings is very difficult. You might be able to do it by making very precise measurements of you know, some branching ratios or something. But in general, yeah, probing scalar couplings is hard. But for gravitational waves, it, even though the scalar coupling here is only by changing by like a relatively small amount, the size of the gravitational wave signal that you see changes very rapidly. So in principle, if you, you know, made a measurement of the mass of some new scale at your collider and also found some non-zero gravitational wave background, this could allow you to very accurately measure some of the scalar coupling potential parameter space. Um, so in general, kind of like the interplay between collider searches and uh, uh, gravitational wave searches for these novel phase transitions is very interesting. Um, but yeah, in summary, basically, um, there's some chance that the electric phase transition happened not you know, as a simple personal phase transition to the Samuel Higgs phase, but involved these new scalars charged in SU2. Um, but in general, uh, 
these scalars then need to couple again with so the gauge bos the standard gauge bosons, meaning you can necessarily produce them colliders, and they are generally very strongly constrained by existing collider searches. In particular, in the case of the kind of like minimal triplet model, the current collider constraints are generally such that the mass of the triplet needs to be larger than about 230 GeV. Um, and this is only going to get more stringent as you get more LC data. Um, and should we, it's worth noting that this limit is already bigger than this limit on the mass is already so stringent that it excludes most of the parameter space that's considered in many papers that look at these novel electric phase transitions. So for example, going back to the previous slide, um, the Again, the x-axis here is the mass of a triplet, and you can see that the two-step region of parameter space for this. Um, so there's other scalar parameters that are fixed in this plot, like the triplet quartic self-coupling. Um, but in general, um, the phase, the two-step phase transition region already starts to disappear at like 230 GeV. So if your mass constraint becomes significantly more stringent, you basically can rule out the two-step region of parameter space altogether. Um, but it's worth noting that. Um, Again, this model isn't capable of successful baryogenesis because you don't have any new sources of CP violation with this new part, this new scalar. Um, so if you wanted a you know more complete model that can potentially generate the baryonic symmetry, you'd also have some other new particles that couple with the triplet, which might significant well in general will significantly modify the resulting uh, collider phenology just because it will change how the triplet can decay. Um, so there's still some chance of um, you know. The mass bound basically being lowered if you have a more complete model with additional particle content. Um, and yeah, finally, yeah, gravitation wave um, detectors are really exciting because they allow you to probe regions of the parameter space that you otherwise can't just by you know making precise measurements of things like scalar couplings. Um, yeah, so electric baryogenesis is awesome because it's testable, um, and it's just generally a very exciting field to work on because. Um, you work with a lot of like interesting physics ranging from you know uh, gravitational waves to you know dealing with bubble nucleation uh, phase transitions um, and kind of like very challenging uh, issues surrounding how you go about solving the actual barren asymmetry that you get around the bubble wall which involves out of equilibrium quantum transport equations um, uh, which is also somewhat related to, you know, a lot of the techniques that are currently being employed in leptogenesis models. So, yeah, in general, baryogenesis, it's a really interesting field. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Leon. It was a really wonderful talk. Uh, does anybody have a question for Leon? I have a question. Please, yeah. Professor. Uh, the trade the the triplet wave being different from zero could contribute to neutrino masses and mixing angles. So uh, if I'm, I think I know there's the model where the triplet uh, gives you neutrino mass, but I think that's a triplet with hypercharge, not a real triplet, if I remember correctly. So okay, for maybe. the real triplet, so th th this like minimal triplet model where we just add a single real triplet scalar, this one can't give you neutrino masses. But I know there are other related models, which we didn't look at, but you could look at, which could both explain neutrino masses and also still give you novel electric phase transitions, but, but not with a minimal real triplet model. OK. And uh, the the fact that the, there is a mixing between the Higgs and 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 and, and your triplet uh, could modify the the width of the of the Higgs. Yeah. So in in, in principle, um, it will modify the width of the Higgs. And if the triplet is less massive than the Higgs, that Higgs could also decay into the new scalars, but the, the bound on the mass is already so large that that's not really an issue. But yes, it, in general, it will modify, but usually the actual like mixing angles you get when basically, so for example, the mixing angle for the charge scalar is very simple. It's basically the sign of the angle is proportional to the ratio of the VEVs, maybe squared, I can't remember, but it's like less than, so the, the sign of the angle is like less than about 0.01 or something. So it's a very small mixing angle. Um, it's just still large enough that this is how the triplet then decays. Um, yeah, so we did look at like, you know, 
modifications to the Higgs production rate and uh, decay width, and you can easily satisfy all those constraints. Great, thanks. And uh, one last thing, uh, uh, you show uh, values of the coupling lambda kind of large, bigger than one. Uh, so for the, you mean back here, this lambda alpsi. So we, we now, so in this plot, they go up to 0 0.1, so 10 to the minus one, and you okay, get the not, right variance. Not, not that um, plot, but sometimes you show a lambda equal uh, bigger than one, two, three, four. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, you mean for the triplet model. Yeah. The, so, yeah. yeah. So here, so lambda can go up to, I guess here it goes all the way up to like four before we cut it off. So again, we do place limits on how large we allow lambda to be, which is like this gray region. And I can talk a bit more about like how I, I think I have some backup slides on, um, yeah, so the constraints we impose on our coupling. So require vacuum stability, um, perturbative unitarity and perturbativity. And okay. there's a specific way you can define that in terms of like, um, um, so if you look at like the renormalization group equations, uh, uh -huh. the one loop, RGEs involve the couplings blowing up to infinity, basically, um, while the two-loop RGEs, they approach a constant value. And at that constant value, the one-loop and two-loop RG contributions are equal and opposite, basically, which tells you that at that point, the one-loop contributions are as big as the two-loop contributions. And we use that to uh, basically define the coupling at which um, two-loop contributions become significant. And we call that non-perturbative and then require the coupling to be, I think, less than a fourth of that, which, um, uh, so a, we use two different notations in our paper. So this A2 is also the lambda sigma H I was talking about before and we require it to be less than about 7.7. .7. But in general, this is kind of the, this is how we place an upper limit on the lambdas. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, we talk about a bit more on the paper, but it, there is some degree of arbitrariness for how you define things like perturbativity. Um, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. So I can go ahead. Hi, Leon. Uh, I just have yeah. a very uh, pedagogical question. So uh, I'm still not 100% uh, sure about why we need why do we need a first order uh phase transition uh in order to explain the variant asymmetry uh instead of i don't know a second order uh phase transition or uh well in other cases uh, people of, often we talk about a strong first order uh, phase yep. transition so could you uh explain a little bit more about that yeah, okay, I'll, I'll start with just what, what is a strong phase transition. So um, strong in the means that the ratio of the Higgs VEV to the temperature has to be larger than around one. And the reason this requirement, so you have, I mentioned before, you have the Svalon rate, which is proportional to, which is proportional to the exponential of the ratio of the electroweak symmetry breaking VEV to the temperature. So mm -hmm. if this ratio is small, so you have a very weak phase transition, um, then uh -huh. surveillance will still be active inside of the bubble. Um, and what this means is uh, that, again, if you look at the sketch here, if your C provided interactions generate a net asymmetry of antiparticles outside of the bubble, um, where surveillance are active and generate a baryon asymmetry, if your surveillance are also active inside of the bubble, then your overdensity of particles will generate a net anti baryon asymmetry. And in general, also, once the phase right. transition is completed and kind of like envelop the whole universe, if Svalons are still active, they will see basically see the baryon asymmetry that you generated and destroy it. So you need Svalons right. to be completely shut off inside of the bubble, which means that the, the ratio here, the, this V on T, needs to be larger than about 1.1 or something. There's like a strict way mm -hmm. that you define like the, the, the barren washout, like the barren number mm -hmm. preservation condition or something. 
So that, that, that's right. why it needs to be a strong phase transition. And then separately as to oh, why it needs to be a first of a phase transition in the first place, again, it's kind of like the, mm -hmm. the Sarko condition that you need these like out of equilibrium dynamics where you have these interactions with the bubble wall because a, a second order phase transition isn't going to give you bubble wall. It's just everywhere in the universe is spontaneously going to slowly gain uh, electric symmetry breaking VEV. Um, so it's just kind of part of the Sarkov conditions. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I get it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, a question, would a, would a, a, um, a first order transition wouldn't be, um, I mean, <clears throat> a first order transition would be generate a non-analytic behavior for the mass of the particles? Or uh, there would be some problem there? What do you mean by non analytic and, behavior I mean, for the masses? It will be like the masses of the yeah. Let's so the masses of the particles. Let us let, suppose, for example, let's think in the mass of the W boson. What happened in the first order transition uh, from when it doesn't have mass to having mass? How does it transition? Yeah. There is some problem being a first order transition. Yeah. So. In general, dealing with how particles interact with the bubble wall and move across the bubble wall is one of the main challenges. And I mean, I, didn't, I, mean, I mentioned before that we use something called the VEV insertion approximation. There are other techniques for tackling transport around a bubble wall. Um, and some of them disagree where they you know, get final bearing asymmetries that differ by an order of magnitude. So there's a lot of work that remains to be done and it is very challenging. But yes, in general, um, we deal with for the VEV insertion approximation, you treat the VEV as an insertion, but in principle, you should complete, do a full resummation of the masses and have a proper spatially varying mass matrix. Um, right. And some of the neurobarogenesis approaches do do that. Um, but for the specific approach we chose, you basically neglect that and treat, treat basically the interactions at the very beginning of the bubble wall as kind of like the main, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. you, okay. you, you do VEV insertions, yeah. Um, but in general, like, uh, yes, the masses of the particles are changing across the bulb wall. And this actually is, I mean, the most naive way you go about solving the bearing symmetry or some of the first calculations are basically you treat the bulb wall as like a step potential where you have, you know, incoming particles and then you have some like reflection transmission coefficients because the mass of the particle changes as you go across the bubble wall. Um, but yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody want more have uh, more questions for Leon? Okay. So thanks again, Leon, for the talk. Um, and thanks everyone else as well. And yeah. we will see each other in the next seminar, hopefully. So thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. Hopefully, it was useful. More interesting. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.